Uncle Kazuya, my father's older brother, hung himself in the barn behind his house in Ishikari, just outside Soparo in Hokkaido. He had left a note. I found out it's too late. Help. We went to door to door and braved people so they vote for him. My mother said he was running for city council. He was an idiot. Your grandma's pretty upset. Was all my father could say. She had called us with the news that early Tuesday morning, September 1988, my 14 years old self tried to detect sadness, anger, anything in my father's expression. He rustled the bank person. He was reading in hell the brooch up to his face like a ship. I was at the foot of the long dining table. He was at the head. He went remote satellite temporarily. At the rest, he did go to the funeral. It was the beginning of a lesson for me. Death doesn't necessarily bring people together. It can be lift the veil and reveal how far apart you are. If my father even cried as much as he needed to, I imagine he would flood every creek, every river vein, until the waters would rise into a swearing pool. We would have to be complete by some extraordinary force to soften him, crack him open, and invite the grief in. As the older son, Kazuya has expected to stay in the house in Ishikari, where they'd been born. He and Aunt Yuko brought up their two boys on the farm. I had met my uncle only once during a visit to Ishikari. When I was at 10, a hazy correction aside from his booming voice, I pieced the rest of him together. From hearing fragmented anecdote and muted conversation between my parents, Kazuya was full of life. A man to be feared, he was generous, oppressed, a thief, he stole land that belongs to my father. A bully, a giant, he contained my shifting preoccupation with Japan, the country where I was born, but did know. He was a trend to slippery, remote family close. My parents had told me very little. They were born in Japan at the end of the Second World War. They grew up poor, married, emigrated, Canada. They moved through life like a walking embalm. They held the war in the marrow of their soft children bones. My father drank himself, now and did best. To follow his father's credo. A real man only speak three words a day. At the end, his brother broke the family rules. I found out it's too late. Help. He would never have expressed such a cacophony when I was alive. It was too many words. After hearing of Kaguya's suicide, I contemplated rope in all its variations, my old skipping rope with wood handless, the tent rope in the garage, the multi-purpose yellow plastic twined in my father's workroom that did seem to have purpose, a rubber hose in the grass, the trailing line of an extension cord, the white TV cable with the metal ends, I conjured up heavy loops of rope lying on the ground in my uncle's barns, like columns of sinister sleeping vipers. In July 1989, 11 months after Kaguya's suicide, our family visited my grandmother and Aunt Yoko in Ishikari. Grandma was a little fierce woman who was bow-legged and rocked side to side like a metronome as a she walked. She often sat in her corner 
in the living room, on a fat cushion on her knees. One afternoon, I was sitting on the floor across from her. Her eyes were closed. For a moment, I thought she might be sleeping upright. Then she was speaking. Do you eat sushi in Canada? She asked me, opening her eyes. I was 15 and would speak some Japanese. She did no word of English. Yes, there's a lot of it everywhere, I replied. It would be nice if you married a Japanese boy someday, she said. They don't exist in Canada, I said. She made a hmm sound and noted. It's sad, she said. That's very sad. It would be nice if you could. Her gaze wandered away and did not return to me. I don't know why he did it, she said, her voice breaking. I had heard that corruption was common in Japan politics in Hokkaido. It was so common that people did particularly seem to be outgrid by it. Some were often more angered when their favorite politician was arrested for bribery than by the corruption itself. My uncle had been a popular councilman in his community. He probably could have gone on unscathed, been forgiven, if forgiveness was even necessary. So why did he do it? You must commit suicide at the height of your beauty. This was something the Japanese writer Yoko Mishima believed when he committed seppuku in government office at the age of 40 in 1970. Kazuya had been 52 when he died. Did he believe he was past in beauty? Was his suicide in part of act of vanity? Had he been terrified of getting old. In the Shinto religion, twice of Sarkistro rope called Shiminama are used to symbolize ritual purification and to ward of evil spirits. The Shiminawa is hung over the door of temples, homes, or building sites after they have been purified. The rope is also used to encircle objects that are considered holy, such as trees or rock. Kazuya has used a piece of rice straw rope to end his life. He was not a religious person, but was his death is some way an attempt at purification. Through the years, I would turn up possibilities over and over again in my mind. It occurred to me much later that it was a way for me to keep him alive. This is a story I was told. It was August 1973. My brother Jiro was four, sitting at dinner. Itadakimas, my uncle said. Jiro picked up Orijiri, a rice ball with his hand, and mashed into his mouth. Fish and rice on his plate untouched. He stuffed another origi in his mouth, bites of rice falling. Jiro chan, a warning from my mother. Jiro opened his mouth, white spring his tongue covered a tiny white bread of rice. Kazuya stand up and rudely pulled Jiro out of his chair. What are you doing? My mother asked, getting up. Kazuya went up the back door. Crying Jiro firmly under his arm with the other hand pick up a circle of rope. Hanging on the first by the shed in the yard was a large oak tree with heavy twice branches. He wrapped the rope around my brother's arm then pushed him to the truck of oak, winding the rope around and around. He must eat his dinner properly. My uncle tried to take nut at the end. He needs to learn to be a man. My mother was shouting at my uncle. Jiro was screaming, the sun flooding the sky. Kazuya went back to the house and relaxed and entitled. As if he had just finished a long day's work. 
No one remembers the rest. My mother never forgave my uncle. My father was there, Jerry can't recall any of it. He jokes that the incident is possibly the reason he always intuitively eats everything on his plate. I invent my own ending. I imagine my mother is struggling with the knot, with Jiro sobbing to be free. Akodama, a tree spirit in the form of an old woman, appears she untied Jiro embrace to his small body, freezes her palm over his forehead as if to calm a fever. She has banished the event from his mind. Early next morning, Jiro peers out the windows. Ashiminawa with paper streamers is tied around the base of the oak. When the earthquake and tsunami hit Japan in 2011, I was living in Toronto. I called my parents in Vancouver. My father picked up the phone. He usually passed the receiver to my mother. Once he said hello because he hated talking on the phone. But this time, he was watching the news, the endless sloping footage of the destruction, the lineups for food and water, the brown water surging over houses and cars. Japan will disappear, he said. It's going to disappear soon. He sounded like a child, then speaking in a voice. I had never heard. He was trying to reach relatives in Tokyo and cannot get through. Something in my father's tone indicated in opening a chance to compensate for a lifetime of miss of conversation we could start with my uncle. But I hesitated. I was too afraid to take the risk. To be evaded, dismissed, I told my father I'd call back later. I hung up the phone and left the tongue-led cord spiraling from the edge of the desk.